Thank you, Paul, for those kind words and the memory of a missed breakfast. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is a pleasure to be here tonight in the heart of London, still the coolest capital in the world. Now, George W. Bush, don't you miss him? <laughs> George W. Bush once said, the problem with France's economy is that the French have no word for entrepreneur. <laughs> well, there is no shortage of wealth creators and entrepreneurs here tonight from Britain, yes, France, and all corners of the world. On behalf of the Financial Times, the pink Financial Times, I salute your achievements, one and all. Now, the other day, I found myself talking to another American president. Donald Trump was sitting behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office, where Harry Truman once had a little sign saying, the buck stops here. I began by thanking the president for making time to see me and for subscribing to the FT. That's okay, he replied. You lost, I won. Now, despite that accent, the Trump presidency isn't quite the Sopranos on the Potomac. But it is very fair to say, and recent days testify to this, that language, the role of family, and the importance of brand Trump are an integral part of the script. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it really does feel like a movie. So what is Donald Trump really like? Well, over the 25 minutes or so, half an hour that I spent with him, I can testify that this is a man in full. He's tall, charming, and yes, a little intimidating. He's a real estate guy. He's a deal maker. So apart from you're fired, his favorite words are leverage and of course, deal. And a Wall Street friend of mine, who's known Mr. Trump for 30 years, offered this insight about his negotiating style. Donald will start by asking for 100%, and immediately, he'll start retreating. Then he'll wait and see where his opponent settles. It's a form of price discovery. I think that the Chinese leadership, for that reason and others, gets Mr. Trump. They may even like him. Now that he's agreed that the status of Taiwan is not negotiable and that Beijing actually is not a currency manipulator. Now the bad news, and we've, we've had a bit of that recently, is that Mr. Trump is utterly unpredictable. He defies all conventions and that can get him into serious trouble like sharing high-grade intelligence with the Russian foreign minister or firing the FBI director. So we are, and here I'm gonna be cautious, we're heading into uncharted territory. But the better news, and that was my big impression from the time in Washington just a few weeks ago, is that Mr. Trump is actually learning on the job. He's grasped that allies like Britain, Germany, Japan, and South Korea are more a boon than a burden. And he understands that the China relationship is absolutely critical, not just for the world economy, but also for a future putative deal with North Korea over its nuclear program. And he's revised for now his views on Europe. He no longer thinks that the EU is a museum in terminal decline. He stopped predicting that other member states will follow Britain out of the Brexit door. Now in one important sense, and I'm sorry Mr. Trump, but we're gonna to have to stop there. 
Your presidency captures the new reality in business and politics. Today, we're all having to get used to the fact that we're living through this pervasive uncertainty. And some of the risk, regulatory, financial, political, is a legacy of the global financial crisis. And over the last 30 years, it's true to say we have taken globalization somewhat for granted. The free movement of capital, goods, services, and people has looked like a one-way street. And now my sense is that chief executives and boards are having to recalibrate in the face of a distinct backlash. But here's the paradox. Globalization of ideas continues apace. The information technology revolution means that we live in an increasingly networked world, a connected world which doesn't correspond at all to the loose talk of, and God, it's a horrible word, deglobalization. So tonight, let me briefly take stock of this new world and offer some pointers, mostly positive, about the future. So I talked earlier about the legacy of the global financial crisis. Ten years on, and yes, it is ten years, we're finally completing the healing process. The interest rate cycle has turned. Central banks in the US, Europe, and the UK, but not Japan, are exiting unconventional monetary policy. And yes, QE, QE2, and the related massive bond buying and cheap credit has produced distortions, especially for savers. But let's be fair to Ben Bernanke, Mario Draghi, and it must be say, Gordon Brown and Nicolas Sarkozy and their colleagues. Their efforts helped to ward off a 1930s style depression. Today, the American economy is still going fairly strong. It's near full employment. Maybe not full-time, well-paid jobs, but still gainful employment. And the S&P has been at a record high. There are, of course, risks out there. China's growth is being driven in part by huge amounts of debt, particularly at municipal level. Emerging markets with dollar-denominated debt are vulnerable to rising interest rates in the US and a stronger dollar. And there are questions, legitimate questions, about Mr. Trump's proposed fiscal stimulus and what it would mean in terms of tighter monetary policy in the United States. The pessimists will no doubt point to a collective delusion with investors thinking that the new normal is lower growth and correspondingly permanent low interest rates which in turn is fueling an asset bubble. But I prefer a simpler explanation. China has not suffered a hard landing. The Eurozone is recovering. The commodity slump is over. And business in America likes what it hears from Mr. Trump. After eight years of what some dismiss, seriously, as semi-socialism under President Obama. Now, whether we can sustain this without the support of monetary policy is yet to be seen. But still, confidence, confidence does matter. Maybe to use that American phrase, Mr. Trump is all hat and no cattle when it comes to tax reform and a trillion dollar infrastructure program. But for the moment, I can report that corporate America is giving him the benefit of the doubt. So, so much for the economics. How about the politics? Now, last year, I wrote an article for the FT describing 2017 as the year of the demagogue. It was also the year of the strongmen. From President Putin in Russia to Duterte in the Philippines, Erdogan in uh, Turkey, Modi in India, and Xi in China. And today, the strongmen are very much still in place. But here in Europe, there are grounds for cautious optimism. And this is a big change after the pessimism which has gripped the continent for the past decade. Now, we often think about Germany being the most important country in Europe. 
And that remains true in terms of economic power and increasingly political weight. But the key country, to my mind, in Europe is actually France, because it represents both the north and the south of the continent, from the English Channel to the Mediterranean. Without France, the EU and the Eurozone would fail. So let me say this. Emmanuel Macron's presidential election win is a victory for the EU and liberal democracy against pinched nationalism and xenophobic populism. Monsieur Macron has a mandate for reform, and I believe he will pursue it in his own French way. That does not mean rien. It means he'll do something. And of course, En Marche is a movement, not a party. The established parties from the far left to the far right are against him, and he needs a parliamentary majority. But a centrist, 30-something ex-banker has come from nowhere to stage the biggest upset since the founding of the Fifth Republic. And come to think of it, if we're talking about uncertainty, Macron's win is a mirror image of America, where a 70-year-old New York property tycoon with inherited wealth and no party loyalty became the first president to enter the White House with no government or military experience in the history of the Republic. So for Europe, just to go back, the big picture is this. The populist tide has not disappeared, but it may well have peaked. France has joined Austria, the Netherlands, and Switzerland in the last few months to turn its back on populist candidates. And in Germany, the anti-EU Alternativa für Deutschland has imploded. Angela Merkel and the CDU are recovering in the polls ahead of the September general election, and that victory of the CDU in Sunday's regional election in North Rhine-Westphalia is a body blow to the opposition SPD and its chancellor candidate, Martin Schulz. So overall, overall, after a fearful 2016, it does look like the center is holding in Europe. Now for the billion euro question. How will this affect the upcoming Brexit negotiations? Uh, I gather that party politics are off limits tonight. So I'm going back to George W. Bu George H. W. Bush. Read my lips. Brexit means, well, Brexit. <laughs> and I, I don't want to go to the Tower of London, so I, I'm just going to add one other observation, one other patriotic negotiation, Mr. Portillo. Once the general election here in Britain is over and we head into these tricky negotiations with the other 27 EU member states and the European Commission, we should avoid seeing everything and every economic challenge through the Brexit lens. What does that mean? Well, first of all, we need to talk seriously about tackling Britain's productivity gap because for all the benefits of our flexible labor market, the UK continues to lag compared to European competitors, yes, including France. And we should begin to redress regional imbalances, stoking the would-be powerhouses to the north, west, and east of Watford. But without, without talking down the city of London, which remains one of the country's greatest assets. It may well be that the proportion of financial services in the UK economy needs to reduce in relative terms, especially if you think of the giddy credit-fueled heights reached before the great crash of 2007-8. But if the financial services sector is to shrink in relative terms, then other sectors of the economy need to increase correspondingly. Otherwise, and I hope all the parties are listening, we're all going to be worse off. Now, there's a lot of talk also about a new industrial policy for Britain after Brexit. What does this mean? Well, surely not a retreat to the 1970s with regular government intervention picking winners by sector. Maybe it should be a lot broader, focusing on education, skills, and training. But finally, we should recognize the defining force of our time. 
the information technology revolution. And this revolution, it's nothing new, but it's important, is subverting hierarchy the world over. It could be cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, the latest worldwide cyber attack, or the two billion plus smartphones which have given everyone, everyone a voice, sharing news, data views, and the moving image in real time all around the world. And we hear a lot in some quarters about how immigration and open trade are the key threat to jobs. But the impact of technology will be far greater in terms of the creation and distribution of wealth and the structure of our society. As editor of the FT, I've witnessed that force of the digital revolution firsthand. We've had to fundamentally change our business model, shifting from a newspaper largely funded by advertising to a, globally, to a global multimedia digital business based on subscription revenues. Today, we have 870,000 paying readers the world over, a record in our 129 year history. These changes in the newsroom, because journalists are very good at telling everybody else what to do, but when it comes to change, well, you know. Um, the fact is, making this adjustment, without it, we journalists would have been writing our own professional obituary. Instead, we built a profitable news business based on a great British brand. And there are other great British success stories many represented here tonight. Here's the rub. Of course technology and our increased network world poses a threat to the established order, but together they also present a great opportunity in every sector of business. The other day I read about lawnmowers the size of robots trundling along rows of cops, crops, checking water levels and <coughs> soil types. This data can be stored to allow farmers to better plan harvesting, replanting, and the use of pesticide. We're talking here about a second agrarian revolution. I caught another glance of the future during a recent trip to China, where Alibaba's Jack Ma spent an hour telling me about the incredible pace of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And at Baidu, the Chinese search engine rival to Google, Robin Lee talked about mass production of driverless cars inside the next five years. It's striking how optimistic my Chinese counterparts were about change. They were just as starry-eyed as anybody, uh, the folks in Silicon Valley. But of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning does mean that we are heading for a new wave of disruption. Whole business sectors, particularly professional services, are ripe for disruption. Just read today's FT about AI and the insurance sector. On the other hand, we are about to enter a new world of work. People may only be employed three or four hours a day. Leisure activity time will increase exponentially. People are going to work less and live longer. And in the world of robots, substituting people uh, substituting people who create and distribute wealth, sorry, in the world of robots, substituting people in this way will raise questions about how we create and distribute wealth and how society in general can come to terms with that. That's a huge challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, the forces of technological change are going to challenge the way we look at ourselves our self-worth, and our daily lives. Business has a vital role in helping to shape this brave new world through bold thinking and informed debate. As editor of the FT, I'm determined that we too, we journalists, contribute to that debate from Brussels to Beijing, from London to Washington DT. Washington DT, no. Uh, sorry, I do apologize. Washington has, America's capital has not been rebranded just yet. Thank you very much. <laughs>